a previous lecture, we talked about the issues of measuring both quality and costs to define value. In this lecture, we'll talk about the measurement of quality and how to think about it. Whether it's on a linear scale, 0 to 10, 0 to 100, whether we use a dichotomous scale, excellent, good, average. And I hope to convince you that the quality measurement piece of the value equation is essential and, in fact, is relatively new in some ways, but quite old in others. Now, one of the things that we as physicians, uh, as well as other healthcare providers do, is we always attack the data. We say we're not measuring the right thing. And we certainly have the quote from Albert Einstein that, or at least it's attributed to Albert Einstein, that not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. That is to say, essentially, we need to be sure we're measuring the right thing and not something that's really extraneous to proving the value equation. But importantly, the father of quality improvement, W. Edwards Deming, said you can't improve what you don't measure. You can't derive that value equation if we don't start somewhere in that measurement equation. So we'll try to talk about over the next few minutes, how do you get to those measurements? How did we start? So as I said, Although some people think the new approach to quality measurement really happened over the last probably 20 years, the first hospital report card goes all the way back to 1863 on notes on hospitals written by Florence Nightingale. And when you see here is they look at the mortality percent of inmates or those in the hospital. And London hospitals have very high mortality while hospitals in large towns slightly lower. And finally, the county or provincial hospitals is the lowest at 39.41. And finally, infirmaries, like the Royal Sea Bathing Infirmary, is down around 12%. First of all, it was amazing that Florence Nightingale started writing these down and asking the questions, can we statistically measure what's going on in our hospitals? Secondly, it really starts the equation or the, the concept of how do we adjust for why people are in the hospital and is this death rate, in this case death, much higher than in one location than another? Is it due to the patients they see? We can certainly think of county hospitals, you know, Downton Abbey going to the hospital was just if you didn't feel well, if you needed a rest. While in London, in all probability, they went to the hospitals because they expected to die. And that might account for the difference. So even back then in 1863, we started to ask the question, do we need to adjust for the type of patients we see? Now, if we go forward a few years, and it, it really did take a while, Ernest Codman, who was at the Massachusetts General Hospital, said hospitals, if they wish to be sure of improvement, must find out what the results are, must analyze the results, and must compare the results with those of other hospitals, what Florence Nightingale essentially began. Now, interestingly, he was a surgeon, and his fellow colleagues actually pushed him out of Mass General Hospital. He was not embraced for these ideas of comparing hospitals on their outcomes. In fact, what he founded and that idea turned into the Joint Commission of today. And just over the last decade or two, the American College of Surgeons recognized him and rededicated his grave plaque. So if we think about this idea of moving to value. We really talk with regard to Medicare, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, and before that, the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and Don Berwick's idea that he brought to CMS of the triple aim. That is to say, better care for individuals, better health for populations, and lower costs. So how do we assess that quality portion of the equation. Most 
individuals in this space divided up into sort of four areas. Structure. Do we have intensivists in the intensive care unit? Do we have certain structural pieces in place that lead to better outcomes? Are there certain processes of care? For example, giving aspirin in a heart attack. Do they lead to better outcomes? And we'll come back to that in a moment. What about intermediate outcomes? Should we actually look at blood pressure, control? Not the outcome of stroke or heart attack, but control, control of glucose measurement. That would be considered an intermediate outcome. And finally, what is the ultimate outcome? The outcome that patients care about. Is it leaving the hospital? Is it readmission? Is it death, certainly? Is it mortality? As well as patient-oriented outcomes, which we'll discuss in more detail in a later lecture. Now, with regard to process, one of the things that is concerning is the fact that people, practitioners, clinicians, don't always follow guidelines. That in fact, if a guideline comes out like thrombolytic therapy in acute myocardial infarction, aspirin, and beta blockers, that we know that better adherence to guideline is associated with better outcomes. And that link between processes of care and outcomes is critical for determining whether or not we should use that as one of our measurement questions. But we also know from studies that date back quite a while that it takes 20 years for a guideline to be put into routine practice. Some studies from the thrombolytic era showed that. Now, with the movement towards quality measurement and incentives for quality, that can be speeded up, it can be enhanced, and that's some of the goals, to take the recent process of care and actually get them incorporated into routine practice. And quality measurement is one of the ways. Now, when we think about it, the ultimate outcome, that health or reduction in morbidity and mortality, is what we want to look at. And we want to make sure, as we implement a process of care, that we actually see a better outcome downstream. Now, that doesn't mean they're always linked directly. It may be an indirect association. And in fact, when we developed the SKIP measures in the team that I worked for, the Surgical Care Improvement Project, what you saw is a marked improvement or increase in adherence to the process of giving antibiotics on time. And in fact, within one hour of surgery and not after the surgical incision. The papers, the literature on whether that worked it's very questionable because, in fact, there are studies that support it, there are studies that refute it. When we looked at the large data set of over a million patients, and this has not been published in, in final form, but what we saw is there was less of an association with a reduction in surgical site infection and more of an association with a reduction in mortality. Now, why would you say this link doesn't make sense unless it went through some outcome to the ultimate mortality outcome. What we believe, many of us who were involved in this project, is just the process of the process, just actually having a group get together and figuring out between nurses, anesthesiologists, surgeons, hospital administrators, to actually improve some degree of care can lead to better outcomes. That teamwork idea is important.